Hello, everybody. The title of this workshop is Writing for Publication of Research, Advice from a Copy Editor, Editor and Publishing Coach. Um, there's going to be three parts here. Um, part one is uh, just a moment. OK. Part one is, is going to be uh, the big picture. I'm hoping it'll be about 30 minutes. And um, uh, I'll speak about getting the, the, the big picture of writing a, a, um, um, uh, a research paper for publication or for practice in your class. Uh, the second part, um, uh, I will talk about language issues, passive for in first person, and bias in language. And the third part, I'm going to talk about cohesion, vocabulary, and dictionaries. All right. Um, first of all, one of the first um, rules of academic writing is to know who your audience is. Uh, sometimes it's the teacher, if you're a student writing for in a class, sometimes it's your teacher, but when you're thinking about publication, it's either, it, or publication or, or, or putting it in the web or something like this, it's, you, you have to know who, who you're writing for in order to, uh, to do the best job you can. And right now, I'm talking to a group of people who I don't know who you are really. I don't know what, if you're teachers. I don't know if you're um, if you want to publish yourself. I don't know if you're someone who's trying to help someone else publish. I have no idea. So the first rule of academic writing is to know your audiences. I don't know who you are. If we, of course, were in a live workshop, I would ask you. And I would ask you to introduce yourselves. I would be hoping that it weren't was not such a large group, and everyone could talk a little bit about who they are and what their interests are, and maybe we could vary a little bit based on what what you really wanted, you know, wanted to know from me. So, as I said, even before you write, you need to consider your audience. And this is a quote from Swells and Feek, who wrote a very nice book called Academic Writing for Graduate Students, and. I don't know really who you are, so I have a bit of a problem. Um, are you teachers or instructors of academic writing? Are you teachers or instructors who'd like to teach writing and you don't yet? Are you somebody who wants to publish because you're, are you someone who has been told by their institution that they must publish and so this is something that you not necessarily want to do but you're supposed to do? And maybe you are some, somebody who's been asked by colleagues to, to give feedback and corrections for papers they want to publish. Or maybe you're someone else. I don't know, and so it's, so it's a bit of a problem for me, but I'll do the best I can with the situation that exists. Okay, <clears throat> so let me introduce myself. My name is Susan Holtzman. Um, I am, I've been working for quite a few years. I, at the university, I was an academic writing instructor. I did courses quite a few years. I did courses for writing for PhD students, which was meant to prepare them to publish their their um, their PhD research. I taught academic literacy for first year students, which was meant to introduce them to all the conventions of citations and and and, and bibliography and things like this. And I also taught advanced undergraduate writing courses. In addition to that, uh, since I'm in my retirement a few years ago, I've mainly been working as a freelance academic editor. When I say academic editor, uh, most all my work, uh, basically all my work is is, um, is academic, uh, I've written, I've edited books and uh, many, many articles from in many, many different fields, and that's mainly what I do right now. I've also taught on more than one occasion freelance writing courses for uh, once I taught in a pharmaceutical company, another time I taught in, um, I taught archaeologists, another time I taught research scientists how to write a research proposal. So I've done all kinds of things in this, in this area. <clears throat> okay, my interest is related to my insights in writing. Okay, so I began really teaching, required courses in Israel in reading comprehension of academic articles. Um, and I also uh, did my MA and my PhD in, in that particular area. Um, the thing is, is that because I began with a focus on reading, I think that that's influenced me a great deal um, to have a basis to know what academic writing is. And I thought that because I worked with students for quite a few years on academic reading, I think this was a very, very good start for me. Uh, my, my PhD was actually on dictionary use, and this is an interest of mine. I've done several presentations and done a lot of reading and 
uh, on response to writing, and I'm um, a teacher of academic and professional writing. Okay, so this is this is where my background comes from. Okay, so where do we start? I have lots and lots of books and uh, about teaching writing, and I'm going to bring examples from these particular three. Science Research Writing, which is written by Hilary Glassman Deal, and it's again for non-native speakers of English. Writing Up Research, Experimental Research Report Writing for Students of English by Weisberg and Booker. That's quite an old book. and was actually the first textbook that I used when I taught writing for PhD students at the university. And the third book I'm looking at is Academic Writing for Graduate Students by John Swales and uh, Christina Fake, and actually you will probably all know John Swales as, <clears throat> as um, you know, the for his genre studies. And as I said, this is something that's influenced me a great deal as well. Okay. Um, all right. Let's look at this first book, Science Research Writing, which is actually the newest book of the of the three. Um, and it talks. About, if I look at the table of contents here, it talks about how to use this book. Uh, unit one, how to write an introduction. And then it goes into grammar, tense pairs, passive, um, uh, writing, uh, uh, vocabulary, um, uh, passives and tense pairs, the use of a and the, adverbs and adverb vocation. Bill, uh, again, a lot of grammar here. I, I just, I don't think. I think that by the time the students get to the university, they've had a lot of grammar. And to start at this, at, with grammar, I, I, I think it's, it's, not, it's not the place to start. Academic writing for graduate students starts general and then gets to language focus, vocabulary, grammar of definitions. Again, I think that it's, it looks at pieces, but not, doesn't get the whole picture at all. And also, there's quite a bit of, 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 of language focus, which is another way of saying grammar. And actually, the third book, the one that I've, the oldest of the three, and I don't even know if it's in print anymore, is called Writing Up Research, Experimental Research Report Writing for Students of English. And this was a tremendous influence on me, because once it was my first textbook for teaching academic, for writing up research. And if we look at the contents here, it starts with the experimental research report, the introduction, establishing a context, the introduction, preview, uh, reviewing previous research, Introduction, advancing to present research. What I'm saying here is here you have actually four chapters that deal with writing the introduction. And I think that this is, um, as I said, this is really important. The introduction is one of the hardest things to write in a, in a paper. And um, often you don't know where to begin and where to end and how to structure it. And as I said, I was impressed with this particular book. It does speak about language, but the basic, the, the, the main um, emphasis here is on the and the structure of a research paper as, as a whole. All right, and we'll get to talk a little bit more about this. So where do we begin with academic writing? Do we start with writing an introduction, do we start at the top and work our way down, or we work on tenses and vocabulary and start at the bottom and, the, uh, and work our way up? Or there's a third option, which I feel is what the, the, Sweek and, the, the Swales and, and Feek book does. Um, I I'm, thought about this as I, I if you probably know the story the, about the the uh, the six people who wanted to know what an elephant was the six blind people sorry and one said it's a spear and one said it's a wall and one said it's a fan and one said it's a snake because each one looked at one little part of the elephant and didn't see the whole picture and so this so the, the Swales book begins writing a problem solution text writing a definition writing a summary, writing a critique, taking little pieces and then hope that you can put them all together in some kind of academic pub paper for publication. Again, I don't think it's the way. My, my suggestion really for anybody who wants to write should begin by reading. You should read academic texts, read different genres, read articles in your field. As you read them more than once, read them critically, read them analytically. Um, by reading them, by reading them, I think that you are going to be able to get a lot more of an idea of what it is to write an academic text than by, by any of the other methods, looking at grammar first or looking at different, writing a definition. Look at the whole, look at, start at the, looking at the whole thing. All right. Then, I, I hope that most of you, are, or I'm assuming most of you have heard of 
IMRAD, and if you haven't, then this is a good place to, to be introduced with this. This is the classic experimental article research, research article, IMRAD. I, introduction, M, methods, R, uh, results, and D, discussion. And if we look at this chart here, this, this diagram, you will see that, um, uh, of course, there's an abstract table. Look at the trapezoid that's the introduction. And this is, and, and then it's followed by study site, methods, results, and discussion, which starts narrow and, and it goes wide. All right. Why, what, what does, this is very, very important symbolically, and it gives you an exact picture of what a research article should look like. The introduction starts wide. You start general, and you narrow down. You give previous research, and you narrow down at the end of the introduction to the aim of your study. So you start with a very general picture of, of the world of your, the context of your, of your research, and you narrow it down by showing the other studies that back up your research. And, but haven't done exactly what you're doing. And at the end, you get to, to what we call the research gap. Everyone else has done this and this and this. This is something that still needs to be studied. I'm going to do it in this, in this study. I'm going to do this. And that comes at the end of the introduction. It narrows down. And the next, here you have a, 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 in, in, um, a, 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 an optional point that says study site. That's particularly important, let's say, in, 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 in qualitative research, where it's the context is very, very important. So, but that's optional, so that won't appear in every, in every research article. After that come methods. Methods are straightforward. These are the materials I use. These are part participants that, that uh, were in the study. These are the tests that I used. I did this and this and this and this. And it's very, as I said, very straightforward, oh, very factual. Then you come results. Again, very, very factual, just what you found in the study. If it's quantitative, you might, you might probably have some, some tables and some graphs. If it's qualitative, you might have some quotes. Um, again, very straightforward, only results, not what they mean. Then you have the discussion, which starts off narrowly reviewing your results and widens out towards the end, telling what these results might mean, what, uh, what um, implications they might have, what impact, and here you're allowed to to expand and to to give other all kinds give other all kinds of possibilities of what your study might be. Um, then there's also optional here conclusions and acknowledgments, um, which conclusions could be there. And again, if you go back to conclusions, conclusions should be very very specific and and not speculative and very very closely based on what your results are. All right. So this is IMRAD. If you don't know about, haven't heard of IMRAD before I, I've mentioned it here, I suggest you look it up on the internet. There are lots of articles about it. What I've said in the last couple of minutes is just not um, enough to know everything there is about IMRAD. So again, I suggest that you, um, uh, that you look it up and that you find out more about it. Okay. Also, another chart that I'm going to show you is the classic introduction. And this I've sort of mentioned before, this is called CARS, creating a research space, creating a research space. And I sort of mentioned it in the last diagram. Again, this it shows there's a trapezoid there, here it's a, it's a triangle, establish a, terri a territory, what exists already. Again, this is your literature review, and you as you t talk about different articles, you get closer to uh, articles, research that's very, very close to yours, but there's something missing. And then the next sentence, establish a niche. What's missing? All of this work has been done already. No one has discovered this. No one has looked at this. No one has uh, studied this aspect. Uh, and then your last part of the introduction, uh, occupy the niche. How does your research fill this gap? And as I said, if you have this classic CARS model, then your introduction will be well written, clear, and and exactly what what uh, journal editors are looking for. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to now that you so I mentioned Imrad and I've mentioned um, cars, but I want to uh, give you some examples from my from my experience. Okay. Publishing research in Nature Scientific Reports, which is a very very um, a very, very prestigious journal. And if you want to notice here, um, 
uh, here we have the, the they tell you that the structure is the best for their their journal introduction results discussion and methods so what we can see here is that um, where the IMRED has introduction methods results discussion oops sorry let me go back oh how do I go back I don't know anyway okay where in this particular journal we don't have that order we have the methods come at the end. Why? That, that's the, the, the format that they ask for. Uh, maybe they feel in their particular journal that the methods are less important. So IMRAD is not a, a final template written in stone. Every journal you look at, you have to look at the submission guidelines, see what they ask for, see what's appropriate for that particular journal, and then follow those things. All right, now I'm going to give you another example from my, um, uh, from my work. This is a journal called Atikot, which is uh, the Hebrew word for ancient. It is a publication of the Israel Antiquities Authority, the Archaeology Institute in Israel. And um, I was hired by them once to, um, to give a, a workshop for, um, uh, for the archaeologists. That was one of the private things that I did. All right. So if we were together right now, I would we'd have a workshop activity, writing for Atikot. Now, I talked about CARS, the CARS model, which is creating a research space. For this particular journal, it's an academic journal, it's a referee journal, very highly respected, but it doesn't have an introduction and you don't create a research space because what hap these are, for the most part, these are excavation reports. What does it mean? It means that a bunch of archaeologists went to a certain site, they did some digging, and this is what they found. It has nothing to do with, they're not creating a research space. They're not filling a gap. They are talking about what they found in this particular at this particular excavation. So, what I would do if we were together right now is I would give you the introduction. I would have printed them up. I would I would assume I would have some idea of the number of the audience. I would have printed up a couple of introductions, and you can see them here. But I'm sure you can't read them. They're much too small. From introductions from archaeological field reports. And what I did when I taught this um, this workshop, so I would know what an introduction was in this particular genre of academic art, uh, academic writing. I took four or five introductions, and what I did was this. I if I would go back, one article was about Jerusalem, another was one is about a location called Mazor. And what I tried to do is to find out what information is included in the introduction of these field report articles. And so what I did is I, I looked at a few and I found a bunch of things that I thought appeared quite often. So the location of the site, the description of the site, the history of the site, the geology of the site, the process of excavation of the site, the grid of the site, the size of the site, the finds of the site, the purpose of the site, in comments on the site. So I found that these were eight things that appeared in five or six. And then to see what was common and what should be included in the introduction of a of a um, excavation report, I I created this this um, this table. And then at the end of this, I could come into the class and I could say, listen, when you write an excavation report, these are the things that you probably would want to include in your introduction. As I said, it's nothing. It's an academic article. It's referee journal, but it doesn't have the creating a research space, the CARS model that appears in many experimental research reports. So what you have to do, the point I'm making now, is that every time you teach or you work on a different kind of genre, you have to, um, you have to uh, investigate for yourself. You have to read and find out what, what you need to do to publish in this kind, particular kind of um, uh, in this particular kind of target. So that's, it's, it's not, there's no template, there's no hard and, there are no, no hard, and, hard and fast rules. You have to go to every single, um, uh, every single journal as a, um, as a new and separate uh, experience. All right. So as again, I, if we were together, I would have given you some examples, I'd given some sample introductions. I would have given you this table and let you figure out the kinds of things that should be there. All right, so my advice for publication of research or any other professional writing task. Okay, so for this first part of, the, of, my, of my workshop, 
begin by reading, read articles in the genre. In other words, the genre could be there. There's all kinds of research articles. There's all kinds of academic articles. History is different or literature is different than is, is not, they're not experimental. They're not the same. So archaeology, um, anthropology is different. So no matter, you, you have to, if you're teaching a general class in academic writing, maybe you have to give them lots of different genres. Let them begin by reading and see the different possibilities. Read the articles critically and analytically. Analytically, yes, C is, is spelled wrong. Sorry about that. You read articles in the publications and the formats on websites and the arenas you want to be in. No jargon and vocabulary. Jargon is not a dirty word. If you're writing in a specific field, you have to use the jargon, the terminology of the field. Note format and conventions, and then after reading a lot and doing your research and starting to get the feel for the genre, then you can begin to write. All right. And I'm ending up with a with a cartoon. Okay. Um, it's me again. It's Susan, and I'm. Uh, going to talk in the second part of the workshop on language issues, um, specifically aspects of ELF and language issues in writing, uh, passive personal pronouns, and bias in language. All right. Um, all right. First, I want to talk about ELF, English as a lingua franca, and the gatekeepers. All right. So when we're writing for publication, Unfortunately, the gatekeepers are not gatekeepers. Those who, the editors, the reviewers, are not always kind to um, to people whose, they, whose English is not exactly like theirs, or who they perceive perceive to be not perfect enough. Um, and and as I said, this is this is a problem, and it's, there's a lot of discussion about this in in the literature. Um, not too long ago, in 2019, John Flowerdew wrote an article called The Linguistic Disadvantage of Scholars Who Write in English as an Additional Language, Myth or Reality. And in truth, he was answering an article by, written by Highland, who, uh, who claimed that everybody, L1 writers, EAL writers, they all have a problem because academic writing is, no, is nobody's first language. Academic writing is a variety of English that you know, you have to, everybody has to learn. So he says it's the uh, uh, Highland said that it was the same for everyone, and actually, um, uh, Flower do disagrees. He says, in my view, there is a certain set of challenges which are shared by all EAL and L1 writers. Okay, that's the variety of English, but EAL English as additional language writers have an additional set of linguistic challenges which do not apply to L1 writers. Okay. So the fact is, is that language is a problem. However, um, I, my opinion is that we should worry less about this and maybe have someone check the, the, uh, the language at the end and correct the present perfect or whatever, and mainly and not worry about it too much. But as I said, it is, it is a problem. Uh, I'll give you an example from my experience of editing. Uh, the Journal of Pragmatics is a very, very respected journal. In there, I always check the submission guidelines. Your text should be written in impeccable English. U.S. American spelling is standard. However, other native usages, sounds like the, the Indians are arriving or something. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know. As American Indians, I, I just, I don't know, are accepted, but not a mixture of these. So impeccable English is what they ask for. All right. In their aims and scopes of this journal of pragmatics, I'm reading from the bold, our aim is to publish innovative pragmatic scholarship from all perspectives, which contributes to theories of how speakers produce and interpret language in different contexts, drawing on attested data from a wide range of languages, cultures in different parts of the world. And the definition of pragmatics is, deals with language and use in the context in which it's used. So it sounds to me like it's really language would be very, very open to <coughs> to ELF and uh, English as a lingua franca, and, and even though they ask for impeccable English in their submission guidelines. <coughs> oh, I, I jumped to the next slide. I shouldn't have jumped. Uh, going back, um, in my experience, uh, I had a client who was publishing in that journal. Uh, she Her English is impeccable. But because she's a perfectionist, she's not a, 
English is an additional language for her, not her first language. Because she's a perfectionist, she asked me to go over it. I did. I made very few changes in her, in her language. Her language is her English language is excellent. The editor, who was a non-native speaker, I could you know was was an English as an additional language speaker as well, uh, insisted that she change a few sentences according to her interpretation of what the sentence should look like. Um, and until she was willing to change to exactly what this editor asked for, she wasn't willing to publish the article. And again, she's the gatekeeper, so we changed it according to what she asked for. But it was ridiculous and it was unnecessary, And uh, but you have no choice. The editor is the gatekeeper. She wants, in this case, she wanted something. We had to give it to her. Another experience I had, uh, I edited this book called The Coins of Herod. It's archaeology. Um, it was published by Brill, which is a very, very well-known academic publisher in the Netherlands. And um, viewers comments, there are still too many basic errors in English, such as the use of mitigate in place of militate. It'd be wise of the authors to ask a native English speaker with experience of literary writing to look through the whole text one more time. Well, the truth of the matter is, is the author of this book is a native English speaker with editing experience. He's, he's the editor of a of a coin, the coin journal in Israel, um, numismatics, and but again, the gatekeepers asked for that, and I think mitigate and militate was probably uh, autocorrect by the computer, but it doesn't make a difference. They they gave this as an example of of his un, unacceptable English, and of course I went over the text again, and even after I went over it again and sent it to them, uh, two English. L1 speakers went over it. They finally said, well, we'll make a few more changes, but it's, it's okay now. But again, the gatekeepers are the ones uh, you have to please. And even if they're, they're not right, and even if they're, um, uh, they're hypocrites, you, you do what they say, but you have no choice. Okay. okay I just saw that I had another spelling error on that. All right. So I'm sort of repeating what I what I said in the first in the first part read your professional journals raise questions about your practice think about how to find answers plan research read some more choose a journal read some more and then when you're done finish the research writing the paper reviewing it and revising it give it to a language editor because as I said sometimes the the demands of the of the, um, of the publications are are unreasonable and uh, illogical, but there's nothing that can be done. So again, my by reading professional journals, knowing your field, raising questions, let your research come out of your practice from the things that interest you in your teaching. Think about how to find answers, plan research, read some more, choose a journal, read some more, and then then do research. And this is the same advice if either for yourself or to give to your students. Again, I would always begin uh, a writing class with having them read first. Having them read, getting notice the, the conventions of academic writing, notice the vocabulary, notice the structure, notice all of the different, notice the, um, the, the IMRAD uh, uh, um, format, if that exists, notice the CARS introduction, if that exists. Uh, no, what, finding what this, this academic um, genre looks like, the one, the particular one that they'll be working on. And from there, they can go on and they can um, uh, they can uh, write. And and again, at the end, have someone else correct the the tenses and the, the things like this. They're minor aspects of the of the research. OK. Uh, work, workshop activity. OK. If we were together, we would share experience or those of our colleagues when they've sent in articles to be published. What were the comments of editors and reviewers? And I would be interested, would have really been very interested to hear your experiences in this. Um, uh, again, if their comments were about the research and the, uh, the way the, the results were presented, or if they commented mainly on small aspects of language and which, as I said, I think is is something that you certainly should take care of, but I don't think it should be the focus of the writing of an academic paper. Write the paper and then worry about that part later. Okay, so we can't share it. So if you want to write me, I'd be glad to talk with you through, we can do Zoom or we can do emails. I have my email I'll be giving at the end.
Now, a second aspect I want to talk about after ELF was um, uh, active or passive and personal pronouns. Now, this is another uh, you know, debate that's been going on. Everyone that use active, don't use passive, active is stronger, passive. Uh, and as again, look at the examples I wrote here. I wrote a great deal of research has been done. This is almost a classic sentence in almost every introduction. Passive. We interviewed the participants. All right, that's active and it has the first person we, which is only used when, of course, you have two authors. The experiment was repeated. It's passive. I sent the questionnaires to here, first person I. Okay, first of all, in, I've, I've looked at many, many research articles with, which, where they did corpus studies and many, almost every single field, you, you have people using the first person I for a single author, we for multiple authors to, uh, to talk about the academic research, the research that they did. Uh, on the other hand, many times the passive is appropriate. I think using the passive to depersonalize the um, the writing is an, is the, is not the way to go. But on the other hand, um, uh, you have to again you have to see that you can use first person, you can use passive. I think uh, using something like the author did this, I, I don't like something like that, or one should expect. I don't like. I think that's very um, awkward and not not very. Uh, and not very smooth writing, but again, I don't think there's anything against passive. I don't think there's anything against using first person. If you want to take your cue from from the, the literature, I think the best thing is again look at your articles and see what they're done. All right. However, um, uh, I looked at a couple of books here as well, and one that I like very much is *The Sense of Style* by Stephen Pinker, who is which is a fairly new book. Um, I don't remember what year exactly, but uh, um, he's a, uh, a cognitive uh, uh, cognitive works. Con I don't remember what exactly. Sorry. Anyway, at MIT, and he still writes. He's written many books. The other one is *The Elements of Style* by Strunk and White, which is a, a classic. Um, uh, I have a quote here from. Um, from uh, Stephen Pinker's book, and it's right here. I'm reading many a tame sentence can be made lively and, and, and emphatic by substituting a transitive in the active voice. What this is a sentence from the elements of style and what Pinker says, this sentence uses the passive voice to warn against the passive voice. And he gives other examples. He's just saying, as I've just said, that using passive is perfectly acceptable. Use it, it's a natural part of the language. Don't overuse it, don't underuse it, don't avoid it or to make everything awkwardly uh, active. Use passive as it, um, you know, as, as is natural in writing. Okay, on the other hand, I looked, did a little search in the internet and I found USC, University of Southern California, updated 2021. And they say, academic writing refers to a style of expression that researchers use to define the intellectual boundaries of their disciplines and specific areas of expertise. All right, characteristics of academic writing include a formal tone, use of the third person rather than the first person. And I don't understand this. What do they, do they want to say? The, this is the author did this, and I don't know. A, a, a clear focus on the research problem under the investigation and precise word choice. So here it says um, that, very, that very, very often we should use the third person. Again, you're going to find um, different different opinions. And again, I suggest my my rather than go to all this advice from all these different places or even listen to me, read the articles in your field, read the journals that you'd like to publish in, read the the journals or the the academic uh, writing examples that your students might have to write in in their particular field. And after you've done that, then you can make your decision about active, passive, uh, use of I, use of we. Again, look at look in your in your in your sources. So there's no definitive answer. As I said, corpus studies show extensive use of personal pronouns in academic articles in all fields. Reading journals in the field should guide your choice. No definitive answer. Passive should be used as needed. It should not be avoided. More importantly, it should not be overused to allow depersonalization of writing. 
depersonalization means saying, you know, um, again, one or or the author or something like this. I think that that's definitely awkward and it should be avoided. All right. Now I'm going to get to the last topic of language that I'm going to talk about today is bias in writing. And I, I gave some examples. Students should not use his, his, her. All right. So there's all this discussion about using, you know, the problem in English where when you have a, a, a third person singular, you have to, and you want to say a, a pronoun after that, you have to identify his or her. One of the solution, of course, is to go to plural. The student should not use their, and that's what's often suggested. But I want to talk about a few other examples. Okay, um, the American Psychological Association emphasizes the need to talk about all people with inclusivity and respect. Okay, you have to use language that is free of bias and avoid perpetuating, perpetu uh, perpetuating prejudicial beliefs. Okay, so I think we know what bias in language is. I want to give you a couple of examples again from my experience as an editor. Here's an article that I edited for the, uh, for Itamar Taxel was published in Environmental Archaeology towards an integration of historical trees into the Mediterranean archaeological record. Case studies from Central Israel. Okay, and here is something from his first draft. Hence, a tree was acknowledged. I'm reading from here. Hence, a tree was acknowledged only in cases where it was associated with a man-made archaeological feature. The emphasis on man-made features in Northern Kiso survey is also attested by Okay, and although quite a few trees are seen in the photograph, at least some of them must have be must be man planted. Okay, so my uh, my workshop activity here is how would you change man made and man planted? Because these are obviously, um, I mean, maybe the archaeological feature was woman made. We don't know who said a man planted the tree. Maybe a woman planted it. These are obviously, um, uh, you know, incorrect usages for today. How would you change them? Okay, and of course, I can give you a couple minutes to think, or a minute to think. All right. Um, all right, if you've thought a bit. Okay, okay, you can change man-made to uh, manufactured. Or there's another way, actually manufactured, if you check the source, it's there, that man there is, has, comes from the word hand and not from the word man. And of course, man planted uh, a tree, which is man planted. I just took off the man because um, if a tree is planted, it was, it was you know, it, it didn't grow naturally. So you, although quite a few trees are seen on the photograph, at least some of them must have be, must be planted, not man planted. The thing is, is that I, when I checked other articles in this particular journal, some of them do use man planted and man made. And so not everybody is so sensitive to it. Now I'm going to give you another example from my experience about bias in language. And that is, um, okay, how would you change man made, man planted? I might, with the man made, I would have recon, probably re revised the whole sentence. Manufacture didn't work very well. Man planted again. We just took off the man. All right. Another journal that I that I, I edited an article for was for the Journal of Neuropsychology, All right. and um, and of course from the submission guidelines was again which I always check authors must avoid the use of sexist or other discriminatory language. All right, and here is their abstract. Now it's kind of small. I'm sure you'll have a little bit of problems reading it. Maybe not because you're looking at your computer screen, and I. For this purpose, language functions in healthy aging. Is there a change with age? For this purpose, 23 healthy elderly speaking, Hebrew speaking individuals at the age of 70 years and above who showed no cognitive decline were examined on various tasks aimed to test their performance in different language and cognitive domains. Comparisons were made between the performance of the elderly and young adults and between the elderly's performance in different linguistic domains. Again, I checked other academic articles and some of them do use elderly. Uh, I found elderly very, very offensive. Uh, it said the age of 70 years and above. Um, elderly uh, has a, 
all right, here are the discriminatory sentences, and I put them, all right, and, and show them in large. Okay, and this is one. And what's upsetting to me here is that according to this, um, <laughs> to this, uh, of 70, I'm above 70, so I'm, I, I all of a sudden felt that I was labeled elderly, and it was very upsetting to me. And I wrote the authors this was so. So um, I looked, I, of course, I did some research on this, and I found an article by When Does Someone Become Old in the Atlantic? And they wrote, elderly is hardly neutral. It's often associated with frailty and limitation, and older people don't generally identify. And so I really, I told them I had a dear serious problem with using the elderly. I felt discriminated against. I didn't, I don't feel frail or limited. And so I, reading in this article, I did find a suggestion, find an alternative that I can live with for elderly. So any suggestions? All right, I'll give you a chance to think. And again, I found the answer in that article by Pinsker. Uh, because as I said, I wanted to find something that was acceptable and was used and not my, my imposing my uh, my opinions on them and uh, I'll give you a minute okay and the Pinsk article from Atlantic they suggested older adults and of course my um, I think my the, my clients in deference to me they changed it all the elderly to older adults and I felt a little bit happier with that okay so um, uh, this is the end of part two, where I speak about uh, language issues, and shortly I'll begin part three, which is talking about uh, cohesion, vocabulary, and dictionaries in the use of academic writing. Okay, end of part three. I uh, begins part end of part two. I'll speak about part three in a few minutes. Thank you. All right, um, welcome back. This is the third section of this workshop, workshop lecture, because we're not really doing this at the same time, and I feel badly about that. But uh, in any case, uh, this is the third part, and we're talking about um, uh, cohesion, vocabulary, and dictionaries. And uh, as I said, I think this, I chose certain topics to talk about during this workshop. And they're not, if I were doing a, a course, these were some of the topics I would touch on. Uh, I chose them, I think, because that they're maybe a little bit different than other things that people talk about in academic writing. Um, cohesion, I find very, very often that, um, uh, that I, I here I don't think it's, it's a, it's a, EAL, uh, you know, English is this language thing. I think this is something that is true of uh, maybe all academic writers. I think cohesion is a problem. And um, uh, cohesion refers to the use of linguistic devices to join sentences together, including conjunctions, reference words, substitution, and lexical devices, such as repetition of words, collocations, and lexical groups. Okay, and I. Um, I, I, as I said, I, I noticed this particularly among the, uh, the hard science writers. Um, and uh, so I want you to, this is a workshop activity. Again, if we were together, we would look at the following text. And can you find something that you believe makes the text cohesive? Something that connects everything together. Okay, now this is an article from 1953 from Nature, an art, a journal I mentioned before, a very, very prestigious journal. Uh, it was written by Watson and Crick, and these are the very, very famous and well-known um, uh, first to suggest the structure of DNA. And this was the article that where they first announced it, first talked about it again in 1953. All right, and here is, um, as I said, here's the beginning of an article. It's a one-page article in, in Nature. Uh, it's You can get it on the net. Again, structure for DNA. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce what it says, something nucleic acid, and it's by Watson and Crick, and it's April 25th, 1953 in Nature. Again, if you Google it, you can find it online, and I think it's a very, very good exercise to use in class to talk about cohesion. Um, no matter what your students are, if they are English, future English teachers or business people, whatever, I think it makes the point very clearly, even though they might not understand the science, which I don't necessarily. All right. 
look through and see what you can see about something that might make this this text cohesive. And what I like it again, it's a one page article, so it's it's not reading pages and pages of science. It's all right. I'll give you a minute. Okay, um, I've given you a chance to look at this. I hope you picked up on something. If not, I've now put the words in red that make this text cohesive. We wish to suggest a structure, this structure, a structure. The mo word model is a, um, is a synonym. It's used twice in the text, but for the most part, they repeat structure, structure, structure and structure. In other words, it appears nine times in this, this very, very short part of the text. And if you would download the entire text, you'll see that the word is repeated in almost every paragraph. And there are other words also that follow through. All right, should they be using this synonym? Should he say one structure? And should they say structure once and model once? I don't think so. I think that in one of the goals of academic writing is to be perfectly clear you can repeat a word. You can use the word again and again and again to make sure that the, the text is cohesive. The text uh, works together and is, it sticks together. And the reader, no matter what he doesn't understands or doesn't understand about science, can follow this text because of the repetition of the words. And if you go through, there are other words also that, that tie each paragraph to each paragraph, each sentence to the sentence that came before. And I've shown this to a few students who uh, uh, especially one, I had one student who was helping with her with her uh, MA thesis, and I, again, I didn't understand the science, but I couldn't connect the sentences at all. I gave this to her, and I said, "Listen, you can repeat words. You should explain words. After you've used it once, after you say a structure, say this structure. Repeat it again." And I really think that it made a difference, and her writing was greatly improved by by this one short example. So I think it's a good exercise to use in any kind of class, this particular text. As I said, it's available on the net, and this can talk about cohesion, about letting your students know that you can repeat a word and you should repeat it. Make sure that the text has the glue that keeps it together. Um, there's no crime in repeating uh, words for clarity in academic writing. I always tell my students and my in my classes. There's no suspense in academic writing. Everything should be clear. Um, I could have talked about headings now as well, using the, besides the main headings of, of uh, introduction, um, uh, introduction methods, uh, results, and um, discussion or conclusion. There, all the subtitles, the subheadings, should all be very clear and very well clearly define the hierarchy of your text. But I didn't choose to talk about that, so I'm going to leave this for right now. Okay. Um, again, let's, this is the last three paragraphs of the same short article. Again, our structure, he calls it now, they call it now our structure, and the full details of the structure, including conditions, will be published elsewhere. Okay, again, this is a very, very good example. I think it's something that you could use in your classes or for yourself. All right. Now, uh, I want to talk about, um, I said the second part was going to be vocabulary, and I hear I'm going to talk about academic word lists and academic phrase lists and dictionaries. And so I'm sharing really, this is more sharing a resource than doing uh, some kind of workshop activity. All right, first of all, uh, I, our nation makes a distinction between four kinds of vocabulary, high frequency words, technical words, low frequency words, and academic words. And really, uh, the words maybe that we have to think about and work on are high frequency words, technical words, and academic words. All right, low frequency words are not, uh, you know, we don't have to teach them rare and unusual words in their our classes. The high frequency words are the words that they already know. Uh, on the other hand, some of the high frequency words they know should be re replaced with academic words. For instance, in an academic text, you're not going to say something happened, you'll probably say it occurred. So sometimes you want to use more academic words. The ac academic words would probably include words like phenomena and criterion, and these probably wouldn't appear in your high-frequency word lists. Um, technical words are the jargon of your 
field. And I know that some people speak against jargon, but you should know the, the terms of your field and you should be using them accurately and, and, uh, and in, in the field that you're, 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 that you target. Okay. Um, all right. So one of the things that you might want to do is, as I said, if we, if we were here all with our cell phones and, and connected to the internet, we would do an internet search for academic word lists. One time there was uh, one list that was a cox, cox head list. Um, she spoke at one of the Asia Temple conferences once, Avril Coxhead, um, and she put out the first academic word list. She did it based on, of course, a corpus search. Today, when I did a, a, a Google search for academic vocabulary word lists, uh, there were many that showed up. And um, there's even an article in uh, Tessa Lee J. It's available on the net again. Review of academic word lists. It's from May 2020, volume 24, number one written by Donna Therova, and here you have a list of several different word lists, academic word lists, and you can look at them today. As I said, there's, there's quite a few. It's a very popular thing today, and maybe for your own self-awareness, I don't know if I would impose this on your students, although some of them do have exercises as well. What I would do, um, uh, what I would do instead is I would rather spend my time if I'm going to give my students, you know, vocabulary lists to learn, I would I would go to phrase lists. And this is another thing that adds to the cohesion of a text. Okay, this particular little uh, uh, book, this academic phrase bank, is available on the internet. It's a general resource for academic writers. It makes explicit the more common phraseological nuts and bolts of academic writing. Okay, I really recommend this academic phrase bank uh, available on the net. Um, and let me just show you what's in there, for example. It has a topic called synthesizing sources. Synthesizing sources is what you do in your introduction when you take, when you're doing a literature review. You, you've read a whole bunch of articles that are the foundation for your research and you have to synthesize them. In other words, you have to just, you can't say so-and-so said this and so-and-so said this. So you have to, it gives you the kinds of phrases you might want to use in this section, in the literature, in the literature review of your introduction. Similarly, Nicolaitis, 2006, found that X. In the same vein, Smith, in his book, XYZ Notes, this view is supported by Jones, who writes that. Smith argues in her data, that her data support O'Brien's view that. So you have a whole bunch of, of, um, of phrases that are, that are, that, that, that we, as I say, they're nuts and bolts. They appear in almost every academic article. As you look at this and then read more, you will see how, how common these are. This is not, this is not uh, plagiarism. This is using the language of the common phrases that appear in all academic texts. Okay, and so you have some, some charts here, and here, synthesizing sources. I also gave you an example of highlighting a knowledge gap in the field of study. In the CARS model, the creating a research space, the last thing, one, the middle thing is creating a, a knowledge gap. Everyone else has done this kind of research, I'm going to do something else. What is not yet clear is the impact of X on. No previous study has investigated X. There's been little quant quantitative analysis of. And all of these expressions, which as I said, you can find in this phrase book, are exactly the kinds of phrases that, would, that fit in the knowledge gap, in the niche place where, where you're saying, nobody has done this kind of study yet. And this is the, there. and then there's, there's, I didn't show you all of the aspects of this phrase book. There's also talking about what your study is going to do. The expressions that you use in, in, in for all the different sections of, of the IMRAD structure. Very, very useful resource. I would certainly make this available to your students, make this available for you. And I tell them that these are expressions that they certainly can use and they should use them. They're, as I said, they're, they're the, the exact way that you, you present the different aspects of the, of the different parts of the IMRAD structure. And they're all laid out in the book. All right, for example, uh, here, the synthesizing sources goes here at the beginning of the introduction with the literature review. The knowledge gap goes here at the end. And again, there's 
there's also words there for a list of phrases for the methods, for the results, and for the discussion. The discussion is probably has a lot of hedging expressions like it seems that, it's possible that, it's likely that, and as I said, all of this you can, can, you can glean from this kind of uh, resource. All right, the last thing I want to talk about today is dictionaries, and I'm particularly about advanced learners' dictionaries. Uh, Cambridge Collins, uh, uh, Longman, and Oxford, I think that's all of them. There might be another one. They're listed here in alphabetical order, not preferential. Uh, they're all excellent. They're all corpus-based. They all have different, each has different features. Choose the one that you're most comfortable with and use. Uh, they also have pronunciation, British and American pronunciation. Here I gave an example from Longman Dictionary. For instance, here's the word few. It gives the, um, the, the uh, this pronunciation, but also you have British pronunciation, American pronunciation. You play this, you can hear it. All the sample sentences that you have, I have to buy a few things at the supermarket that give you examples. You can hear all the sentence read. S1, W1, it tells you that it's one of the most common words in spoken English, one of the most common words in written English. It gives you the grammatical form, if that's interesting for you. It tells you fewer, fewest, the comparative and the supportive forms. In other words, and if it's a verb, it will give you the past tense and the irregular forms and spelling and, and all right. Then, just to very, very often, you will have a, a grammar explanation if there's a problem with certain words, something with the grammar. And here I chose few because there's a difference between few and a few and it explains it here. A few means a small number, for example, two or three people or things. Few means not many or hardly any. It emphasizes how small the number is. You say few, with, uh, all right, few people knew who it was and we say not many instead, but still, I find that sometimes there's confusion between a few and few. If if you see that, you can tell the students, check in your learner's dictionary, and you can see what the difference is, rather than you explaining all of these things. They, there's, as I said, there's grammar, there's pronunciation, there's um, spelling. They, there's a lot of sources here. And I, again, these are things that you have in a learner's dictionary that you don't have in a regular dictionary. And so I suggest learning to use the learner's dictionary as a resource. I use them all the time. Uh, it gives me British and American differences. If I'm not sure about a spelling, if it's British or American, lots of times that comes up with all different kinds of things that I just I didn't think about before, and I check them. And the the, uh, the learners dictionaries have, are very very good at giving me the information I need for this. And on the other hand, I like to use Merriam-Webster their thesaurus. Uh, they don't have the same kind of um, uh, grammar features that the um, that the learner's dictionary has, but for instance, if I go into the thesaurus and look for um, initiate, synonyms for initiate, words related to initiate, and then they also have when would inaugurate be a good substitute for initiate, and that gives you an explanation. Where would start be a reasonable alternative to initiate? It gives you an explanation. How are the words usher in and inaugurate related to synonyms to initiate? So they have a little bit more information about why you might choose one word rather than another. What's the connotation? What's the wider um, what's the wider meaning here? Okay. Uh, and um, with this, I'm coming to my writing workshop conclusion. In the beginning, I talked about genre and the structure of an article. I talked about Imrad and cars. In two, I talked about language issues, about passive, the first person, uh, and, um, uh, and bias in language. And in the third part, I talked about cohesion, vocabulary, and dictionaries. Um, this has just been a number of selected different topics. Um, I don't know if I, I again, if I, if I had a live audience, we could ask questions and have a very useful discussion about the problems that you've had, and I could get into the specifics that uh, were important to you for your particular situation. Unfortunately, in a video conference, I'm sitting here talking to my computer, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a little frustrating for a workshop like this. I have, I'm writing my two emails, H-O-L-Z, I'm an American, if you're British, I'll say ZMS at Zahav, Z-A-H, Z-A-H-A-V, net I-L, or Susan Holtzman, S-U-S-A-N-H-O-L-Z-M-A-N, B-I-U, at gmail.com. 
write to me at either of these addresses and I'll, I'll see if I can answer you and, and we can have a discussion about things that you may have personally, your, your personal questions or things that you might have want to ask about my incomplete probably and not very clear uh, presentation. Uh, did the best I could under difficult circumstances. I really wish that I could be in India and talk to all of you face to face and I'm hoping in future conferences that we'll have that opportunity. Meanwhile, I hope you all stay well and enjoy the conference and thank you for listening.